the solemnity of Mary, the mother of God. And some brief history about that I think that might be useful for us or helpful for us to understand a little bit about what it is that we celebrate. Because I think what we find is all of the times when we celebrate Mary, where we have a special mass for Mary, whether it's the Assumption, the Immaculate Conception, today Mary, the mother of God, the celebrations and the feasts, as is fitting for our Blessed Mother, who was so humble, actually end up pointing and saying as much about us and about her son as they do about her. It's almost as if as we gather to celebrate her, all of those celebrations end up again pointing us back to her son and also what that celebration says about us as people. So a little bit of brief history. You may have heard of the phrase ecumenical councils. We had an ecumenical council in 1965 with the Second Vatican Council. Um, an ecumenical council is any time the church, kind of all the bishops or most of the bishops and leaders in the church gather together to talk about something with regards to unifying and continuing to keep the church together and unified as one. And so any time there's an important topic, uh, that there are topics that need to be discussed, etc. And so our first ecumenical council was in 325, the Council of Nicaea which produces the creed that we still say today, the Nicene Creed, that we will say here in a matter of minutes, here at Mass tonight. And so the reason that the, sect, that, the, that the Council of Nicaea in 325 is convened is mainly because there was a priest by the name of Arius who was out teaching that something that was wrong, it ends up being, but it had spread far and why it had spread all throughout the church and throughout the world. And Arius was out teaching that Christ was not God in the fullest sense. The baby, Christ's child, was not, although he was Jesus, he was created by God. He was not God in the fullest sense. Arius said lots of great things about Jesus. He's deified, he is, you know, like God, or was created by God, was later on became God after he was made whatever it might be. And so over half the bishops, it's estimated, and around that time of 325, bought in to Arius' teaching. They were on board. Arius is right. And so the bishops that thought that what Arius was teaching was wrong and problematic decided we need to get together and we need to hash this out. So they, get, they convened the, the Council of Nicaea. And an interesting person was there. We have Arius, of course, but another player on the other side was St. Nicholas, who we all remember as the person who puts candy in our shoes. But St. Nicholas was actually did something much different than give out treats. He went after Arius at the council, presented his argument and his belief and teaching. St. Nicholas, jolly old St. Nick, went across the council floor and slapped Arius in the face. Merry Christmas. <laughs> now, St. Nicholas was punished, and, uh, but was later reinstated by the Pope and uh, to continue his ministry, and was eventually able to participate in the rest of the council. But what happened in the wake of that is that eventually, at that council, Arius' teaching is condemned. Now imagine today, half the church, or over half the church, believing something wrong, and out of a council being told, what you thought was right is wrong. And you have to change your belief if you want to be in the church Catholic. That's what happened, and it didn't happen overnight. It took a long time to kind of have everybody that, to get back into the fold and join back into the right teaching of the church. And so I think a takeaway from that Council of Nicaea is that there was debate, discussion, theological discussion and debate, and it even got violent at times. But eventually the church came out and said something very important. You are either in bounds or out of bounds. There are things that you can believe, but that place you, if you believe them, outside the church. A third ecumenical council. So fast forward to the year 431. There were lots of them early on because there was a lot to hash out. And the third ecumenical council also had violence and the threat of violence. It also had 
vigorous debate. It also had the church fractured, and basically what we're celebrating today, Mary the Mother of God, was the teaching that came out of the council. It was the Council of Ephesus in 431. And it had, instead of Nicholas versus Arius, the boxing match, it had Nestorius versus Cyril of Alexandria. And they actually, thankfully, did not slap each other. But there was still actually the threat or the concern that violence might break out. There was fighting and bickering and discussion, good, healthy discussion. Nestorius said that we can't really say Mary is the mother of God. Now we can tell who won because we're celebrating Mary, the mother of God, today. Nestorius, again, we can't say that. We can't say that Mary is the mother of God. Cyril, on the other side, said we can say that Mary is the mother of God. Not in the sense that she gave birth to the one being of God, but she gave birth to Christ, who is God. There's no way to distinguish the child in the, in the nativity scene, the child who was born in Bethlehem, from God. We can't say that the child was 90% God, or 95% God, or whatever. It's God. Jesus is God, in a way that you cannot make a distinction. And so, the ruling out of that, the, the, the teaching that came out of that third ecumenical council is precisely why we're here today. Mary, the mother of God. If you say that slowly, that's really baffling. It's a mystery, right? And it's a beautiful teaching, but it's something that we hold very dear to us in our Catholic faith. That Mary is not just the mother of a human being, Mary is the mother of God. And again, in the wake of the council, what do we see? We see the church that had fractured, taking a long time to come back together. And there are still people who hold Arius' position, although you don't hear about them very much, and they basically dwindled to nothing. There are still people who hold Nestorius' view, but that church has basically dwindled to nothing as well. And so the reason that I bring all of this up on this Marian feast day is, first of all, a couple of, I want to maybe offer a couple of takeaways from all of this for us and what we're celebrating today. First of all, one thing, we can laugh at the violence, and we did, and it is funny. St. Nicholas, jolly old St. Nick, slaps someone in front of the Pope. But I think an interesting question for us to think about in regard to that is to ask ourselves, do we care that much? Do we care enough to actually, not actually go do it, but to the point where we have the thought of, that person needs to be slapped? Now we shouldn't do it, of course, but I think most of us today would sit around and say, I don't care. <laughs> Believe whatever you want to believe. You know, whatever you want to believe, that's great. If that works for you, fantastic. St. Nicholas did not say that. St. Nicholas said, if you're going to lead other people down that road, I'm going to come over and slap you. Even if it means me getting thrown in jail for a while by the Pope. Do we care that much? Do we care not just about ourselves, but do we look around and say, what is being taught to other people to? And is it wrong? And if it is wrong, will I say something? Will I do something about it? The second takeaway, I think, for us to think about as we think today about Mary, the mother of God, and how some people believed very strongly 1,600 years ago that this was a ridiculous and wrong celebration. I think the takeaway for us, do we think there is an imbalance and an out of bounds? Do we think that there are things that one can believe that actually place you outside the walls of faith? Church believes that. Cyril believed that. St. Nicholas believed that. The church has always believed that. But most people today don't seem to believe that. Or there are certainly a lot of people who don't believe that in our culture. Believe whatever you want to believe. You can be Catholic and do whatever you want and say whatever you want and believe whatever you want. If you're Catholic, if you call yourself Catholic, then you're Catholic. But that's not what the church says. Yes, certainly there are things that are able to be discussed and things that we have still vigorous discussions about and vigorous debates, but there are also questions that the church has come out and said, like in 431, like in 325, this issue is settled. This issue is done. This stance on that issue is in bounds. This particular stance over here is out of bounds. And so, do we believe that? 
We believe that. So are we engaging in debate and discussion about the things that are still open? And do we even know which things the church has said are settled? Do we know which things are still being discussed today? Which things are open for discussion? Do we know all the teachings of our faith, particularly those things that the church has said are in and out of bounds? Do we engage in debate and discussion about the things that the church has not said definitively one way or the other? I think, finally, a takeaway. May, I would hope I would to challenge all of us, all of our, both of my parishes, the college community at DePaul, anyone that I work with or minister to, I would love to see 2016, year 2016, be a year where we learn very vigorously about these teachings. The what, the why, where they come from, Using, I hope that our parishes use and utilize formed and continue to learn more about our faith, care enough about our faith to want to learn in the first place, attend presentations, go to our CIA classes, even if it's just for a brush up, ask questions, read some things. We have that, that formed website that I keep trying to talk about is an amazing resource. If you watch everything on there, you'll be smarter than Cyril and St. Nicholas combined. Right? You'll know everything, there, everything that, anything that you want to know about your faith is on that formed platform. We have CDs that we have, and those are also available on form. If you want to learn about your faith, it's easier than ever in the history of the world to learn about your faith, to learn about Mary, to learn about her son, and to learn about why the teachings of the church and the teachings about Mary and the teachings about her son, to learn why they matter in the first place and what they say about us as well. We pray that during this coming year, we may be people who engage and enter more fully into learning the ins and outs and content of our faith so we may help more people come to be inbounds and not remaining in ignorance outside the walls of the church.